Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone from Chess Publishing. My name is Simon Williams. I'm a grandmaster from England and I've been playing chess for far too long now. 34 years old, started playing chess when I was six, so have a fair bit of experience. I suppose nowadays I'm better known for my books and DVDs that I've um, brought out. I've maybe filmed something like 10 DVDs on various parts of the game of chess and I've maybe released something like eight books so I have a, a fair bit of uh, opening knowledge and understanding that I intend to share with you. Now the idea of this video and hopefully if it's popular we'll be doing future videos in the future um, is for you the chess publishing readers and viewers to pick a certain opening that is very popular and then for me to take that opening and to do a video on that opening. So to look at some of the ideas in that opening and maybe look at some of the theoretical aspects of that opening. Now, obviously in a video, it's a bit harder to do a full theoretical study of an opening, but I wanna just uh, try to make it, one thing maybe that Chess Partner is lacking, and don't get me wrong here, it's a great site. I use it myself and it's brilliant for up-to-date theory. I think the best way at the moment currently in the world to learn up-to-date theory in chess. Um, it's all explained for us, the viewers. So a brilliant way to keep up to date with stuff. And I know a number of world-class players who log into chess publishing. But what these videos are also aim to do, which maybe chess publishing doesn't always cover as much, is to give you some of the ideas behind the opening. So to give you a more basic round view of the opening. So you can have um, an overview of what you should be trying to achieve. So I'm going to try to explain the strategical and tactical points. Obviously, we will look at it theoretically as well. Um, so hopefully, if these are popular, what we're going to do, you, you guys on the forum, um, if you either send me messages at my uh, Ginger GM address or Tony messages, or if something seems to be trending on the forum, then we will pick that trend and do a video on that opening. So you have a second way to look at one of your favorite openings. Now to start off with, I thought it would only be right to go with a Dutch defense. Now I'm probably best known for the Dutch defense. It's an opening I've played most of my life, especially the classical Dutch. And I've been keeping a kind of an eye on the, the, the thread on the forum on chess publishing. So um, it's, I mean, I have, to, I have to say, some of you guys in chess publishing, you, you leave some great ideas. And um, I, I'm i really impressed by the threads on the Dutch defence that I, I've, I've read. So I have to congratulate you guys on the thread just as much as anyone else. And a lot of the, guys, a lot of the ideas you're developing there are ideas I have not considered. So thank you. I have to thank you myself for your ideas on the classical Dutch and this thread. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to have a look at your ideas but I'm also going to give you a quick overview of the mainline classical Dutch and the way I play the classical Dutch. So I'm going to quickly explain some of the ideas to you and tell you why I find it an attractive opening to play. But I will be looking at the ideas you've been talking about recently on the forum and just to try to put them on the board and maybe give you sort of my opinion of uh, the current state of affairs with the theory. So let's dive into the action. So the classical Dutch is the line with d4, e6. And I will let you know, we're only going to do this video on the classical Dutch. There will be more, should I say, popular openings in future videos. But we've got to start with the classical Dutch. This is the opening that helped me beat Gelfand, and it's what I'm most famous for as a grandmaster. So let's go through the moves. And the main line position is this one here after knight to c3. Now, I've always believed recently the black's best option here is knight to e4. And I think this is the best way to try to play for black. And I have to say, it's very hard, in my opinion, for white to claim any kind of advantage. Now, a little inside secret. I, I'm really playing this move knight to e4 now only against people higher rated than me. Because some of the positions tend to be a little bit drawish. I don't think black's in any trouble. Um, you might disagree with me. We'll have a look at some of those lines. But I, I play against higher rated players because I'm not necessarily that upset if the game ends in a draw. 
Against lower rated players, I might try to change my openings a bit just because I don't want their position drying up too quickly. Now, for Glenn's, um, Glenn, Glenn Fleer wrote some very good games on White developing his knight to h3 earlier on, so I would suggest that this move knight to h3 should be studied quite hard as well. But Glenn's given some very good suggestions for black there, so I, I don't need to cover that. And Glenn's update uh, this month on uh, the knight to h3 lines following my game against Ipatov um, should basically give some very um, give you some very good ideas of black and it's given me some good ideas especially if you look at the, his notes the queen c7 idea seems like a safe and good way to play but here we're going to concentrate on the critical line knight takes e4 now queen to c2 I don't believe gives white an edge I think we simply take on c3 if b takes c3 knight c6 which I've covered in my DVD on the Dutch, my ebook, and if queen takes c3, a5. Now, Moskalenko gives this move a slightly dubious um, in his great book, The Diamond Dutch, really great book on the Dutch defence. Now, I, I disagree with the statement. Um, I mean, Moskalenko gives the move bishop to f6 here, and after b4, knight to d7. And I think as early as 2002, I, I wrote about this line in my first book, um, Play the Classical Dutch. And it might be okay, but I don't like giving white so much queenside space. But this is probably okay. I still think I prefer to move a5 here, taking a grip on the b4 square. Moskalenko now says that rook to e1 should give white an advantage. But I think this is very unclear, and I think black gets great play after knight to c6. And I've used this move to beat Joseph Gallagher, former British champion. Um, the critical line is e4, but now we have e5. A typical counter break in the center and one bit of advice i need to give you in the dutch defense is that when your opponent plays e4 you never want to take on e4 here because after rook takes e4 you're clearly worse this backwards e pawn is a target for the rest of the game so one thing you need to do in the classical dutch is avoid meeting e4 with f takes e4 you either always need to meet e4 with e5, as in this position, or in some cases with f4. But the move f4 is normally only good when the bishop on c1 is developed to b2. But that's just a very key point with the classical Dutch, that you need to meet e4 with e5. And here, tactically, it seems that black is fine after, for example, an exchange on e5. Now, bishop to b4 is a very nasty threat. And after something like c5, Bishop f6, I think black is fine here. Okay, there's um, some analysis in my original book, Play the Classical Dutch, on this, but I think it should be fine. Now, knight takes e4, in my, in my view, is the only critical try, the only way white can aim to gain an advantage. We recapture, and now I think knight to d2 is critical. Again, Glenn Fleer co covered knight to e1 in his update. I think this is fine for black. I, I didn't play particularly well in the opening against, against uh, Krash Krasenkov, in the game that Glenn covers there. But after d5, um, f3, d takes c4, my opponent now played f takes e4, I captured on f1, but e5 would have led to a very nice position for me in the game. Glenn gives the move bishop e3 as his su um, suggested move for white to try to get an advantage, and this is what Glenn prepared against me himself. Now, he, he doesn't actually suggest the return knight to d7. And this looks like a very interesting reply to me. Um, and for example, after queen c2, this knight comes to the d5 square. Knight to f6, and we have a very tactical exchange, but after queen takes c4, knight takes d5, knight to d5. Now something like knight to c2, b5 is a very good move here. I'll let you look into this in more detail yourself, but one of the main points is that queen takes b5 loses a piece to knight takes e3 and queen takes d4, and black is winning here. So I'm not too worried about this uh, suggestion of Glenn's after the critical move, knight e4. Let's just go back. So this is the critical position, in my opinion, in the classical Dutch, and I'm not too concerned after knight to e4, knight takes, pawn takes, knight to e1. This doesn't concern me. Now, knight to d2 looks like a much better move. White's aiming to play f3 immediately. 
The reason I think this is a critical test for, du for the Dutch defence is because White has a space advantage. And if after F3, Black has to capture on F3, White will just recapture with a piece. And he has a slight space advantage and Black is lacking any active play. And this is something I certainly want to avoid in the Dutch. So you have to play D5 here. And of course, F3 is now critical. Now, my way of playing against this has always been knight to c6. And this tries to avoid the typical positions you can get after something like e takes f3 and then knight takes f3. Maybe not knight takes f3 here, maybe bishop takes f3. But these positions, I, I think, are, are playable for black, but they're just slightly unpleasant for black. Black White has pressure against the d5 square here. So this has always been attacked rather, you know... And he has a pawn on c4 already, so white's always slightly better. Okay, you can defend them, but this is not why we play chess to defend very slightly but worse positions like this. So after f3, knight to c6 is my preferred choice. And now, well, I have to say f takes e4 has superseded everything's the main move. e3 is interesting. I think this is an improved version for black compared to the last line because now we can take an f3 and go b6. Sorry, excuse me. We can take an f3 and go b6 here. And I think here black is developed well enough. He can go bishop to b7, bishop to f6, and I don't think he should be really any considerable amount worse. It's just an equalish position here. So f takes e4 is critical. And now rook takes f1 as the main line. And now we're really going to concentrate on the forum suggestion of this new idea, king takes f1. Found by forum viewers. So I have to say, brilliant idea from the Chess Publishing Forum. And this is what we're going, I'm going to try to take in these future videos. If if you want me back, that is. You might be sick of me after this first video. I, I hope not. But if, if you want me back doing some videos, then we're going to um, basically concentrate on some of the ideas in the forum. Now, the old idea, knight takes f1, I think is, is currently fine for black after d takes c4. Bishop to e3. And now... Bishop to d7 is black's best move. And I think black is very comfortable here. I mean, it's a very dynamic, unbalanced position we have here. White has this central majority, but black has this queenside majority, which he can often use the devastating effect. And the position is very murky, very complicated, and very hard to assess. But I think, in general, black's chances are very good here. And my, my, my results, personally, have been of very high standard. For example, I've had a couple of games after e5. Now, bishop to e8 is the best move. And here, okay, I won't go into too much. You can you can look look on look into this yourself. But surface to say that black is doing absolutely fine in this position. One point after bishop e4, we go bishop to g6, trying to gain control of d5 square for our queen. And after rook to c1, we simply go b5, and this gives us good play. So. After the sequence from the opening, d5, f3, knight c6, takes, takes, king takes f1. This is a very peculiar looking move and obviously a computer move, but it keeps the knight on this square. Now, I believe there's only one move that black can play here unless he wants to be a lot worse. He has to capture on c4, releasing pressure against the d4 pawn. This, this is forced, this variation. And now there are two moves. Now, uh, originally the computer gives pawn to e3 here, and this is a very natural move. Now, I think I found quite a good solution against this, which at the end of the calculations, the computer gives us equal. And I think the best way to meet this e3 move is by playing knight to a5. And this is quite a common theme in this kind of variation. Often we want to continue with c5 and b5 here, and we're trying to prove that our c pawn is a strength and not a weakness. Now, the only critical approach to this, I mean... If white does nothing, then c5 is going to come, or given a chance, b5. So the only critical approach is queen to a4 in this position. And I think here the best move is pawn to c5, immediately attacking white's center. Now white should capture on c4, and a clever move here, knight to c6. Black is temporarily a pawn down, but he has a lot of pressure against white's center, and the king on f1 is misplaced. So good compensation. And one interesting line I've been studying is after the move d5, b5. 
and this is the computer's first line for both sides but white has to be extremely careful not to lose very quickly here the point being after queen takes b5 knight to b4 sets up the threat of bishop to a6 and this is is very risky position already for white um i'll just show you the computer's analysis a little bit further queen to a4 bishop a6 and now it gives a3 as the only way whites can try to hold some kind of pull on the position but i don't see a problem for black after bishop takes c4 e takes d5 and after white captures on this square we take on e4 and something like b takes c5 queen d3 and even though black is a pawn down black is extremely active here and it's hard for white to develop and this pawn can drop and we have a rook coming to f8 so Black is active enough in this variation, so this is not a critical test here of the line. So um, after king takes f1, d takes c4, people on the forum have been suggesting to move knight to c3. Now, originally I liked the look of someone's suggestion bishop d7 here, but now I've come to dislike this move, I'm afraid, um, because of the reply d5. I'm not so worried about bishop to e3 because the people on the forum have pointed out queen to e8 is the correct move. Now I'm sorry, I have to apologise not to mention everyone individually on the forum. There's so many of you, so many of you on the Dutch forum suggesting good moves that um, I, I have to thank you all. But I don't like this so much after the point that after bishop d7, d5 to me. I've analysed this with Houdini and it seems good for white. So my suggestion after knight to f3 is the simple b5 move. And this has a lot in common, this kind of structure, to some of the structures we saw um, a while back when white takes an f1 with his knight. So it has a common theme. Now, some things to bear in mind. Let's just give you some hints about this position because it's an extremely bizarre and unique position. One of the things is that often whites will try to attack with the move a4 here. And this is a possibility. But... If you're given time, black's next to me is a rook b8 and a6, just to support the b5 square. And then, as we'll see in a following variation, if, if white ever plays a4, our knight can come to a3, a5 to b3. And this is a great suggestion. Now, a lot of time this pawn can become very strong. And we often want to combine ideas of queen e8 here and the queen coming over, the bishop coming to b7 and the rook coming to d8. So these are typical ideas you're trying to do. Now you have to be careful sometimes if your bishop comes to b7 because it leaves the e6 pawn weak. So a safer way to play is bishop to d7 and just play like this. But in fact, I think this position, according to my analysis, doesn't offer too much danger for black. I mean, let's just take a look at a couple of lines. Um, well, let's say white tries a4 immediately. This is very logical, but I, I think, actual fact, I think black is better. I mean, you never, ever want to break up your pawn structure here by taking on a4. This is very, very ugly. Your c-pawn is weak. Try to keep your pawns together. So b4 is a great suggestion. And after something like bishop to e3, well, I think we can play rook to b8 first. This is useful always to remove the rook from the bishop's line. And the point is, this will transpose into an analysis in a minute. We're going to go knight to a5 next. And I think black is better in this, in this uh, variation. So after b5, I think bishop to e3 immediately is a better move. And here we just want to play rook to b8. This is an important idea to remember, just rook to b8. We can now meet a4 either with b4 or even a6. We move the rook from the line of white's bishop on g2. And it's useful in a number of variations. If we go b4 and c3, the rook could come into play. So this, this seems to me a very promising position, actually. Now, I think a4, again, is dubious because this line we just, we just uh, spoke about. b4 and uh, something like d5, knight to a5. Okay, you lose a pawn after bishop a7, but after rook a8, bishop to e3, the knight comes into b3. And this knight now dominates... The rook on a1 and for just a measly pawn black has incredible compensation so i think black's better here i think black is just has an advantage here requires you know not a big advantage requires precise play from both sides but black is fine so after rook to b8 bishop to e3 bishop to h3 is a computer move and i think the best option 
Now, my suggestion here would be to consolidate your queen side first with a6. So I'm really just following Houdini here. And now Houdini gives king to g2. And now we play this important idea, queen to e8. The queen comes over to the king side. It gives the d8 square room for the knight on c6. And generally, I think black is fine here. Because he always has potential with his queen side pawns. And the analysis I've done a little bit more is d5. Now the drop, the knight drops back to d8. And this is one reason the queen's good on e8. And after a mass exchange on e6, let's say white tries to grab a pawn with queen d5, and something like bishop f6, e5. Well, black's pieces come into play now. Rook d8, queen b7, bishop b7, bishop takes a6, bishop c5. And I think black has great compensation for one measly pawn here. Um, so, I mean, this is all I really wanted to add to the discussion on the classical Dutch with the main line position knight to e4 here, a move I have a lot of faith in. Um, and knight to e4 is clearly the critical move, but currently, with the theory I've just told you in this line, after f takes e4, I'm very positive about black's chances. So the ball's back in white's court, and I think this classical Dutch line with knight to e4 is really still giving black white some problems now other points i should just point out about this move it's very i think it's a good move because it vacates you have six square for the bishop and black's whole plan in this classical dutch structure is to push forwards with e5 at some point prepare this move and queen c2 does not seem any concern to me because of a5 here when we're going to try to play the move e5 so we're going to pair this with bishop f6 knight f6 e5 Again, this leading to a very good position. So I think I'll stop there because it's been a rather long video. And obviously, if you don't play the Dutch, this might not be so good for you. But I think we're just trying to keep up to date with current theory. It's an opening I specialize in. I'm going to do my next video, I think, on the King's Gambit, a much more fun variation. And I'll show you some suggestions I've had recently. Um, but all in all, I hope you enjoyed that video. Please give uh, me, Tony Forum, your feedback if you want me to continue doing these videos. Now, I, I should say that these videos, I'm doing them, um, I, I have my own website, gingergm.com. So follow the link to that website and um, you can browse the shop, have a look at the latest uh, things in the shop. I have um, a, a DVD on this opening in there so you can learn everything about the Dutch if you buy that DVD. I have an ebook in the shop so you can also purchase a book on the classical Dutch there. And there's lots of things that you might find interesting in the shop. I also have a YouTube channel with more videos like this up on, so please go to the YouTube channel if you want to. They're all free, so browse the YouTube channel. It might help you learn some stuff, some bits and bobs. And lastly, I have a Twitter account, GingerGM. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter for any latest uh, updates on what I'm doing. But anyway, I think I'll stop there. I hope you enjoyed the DVD. Uh, DVD? Sorry, DVD. I'm going crazy here. I've been talking too much. Hope you enjoyed that short video. Um, just introduction to these videos really and I picked a very specific line here in future we'll do it a little bit more simple um, but I just wanted to try to cover some of the Dutch followers um, so more of a personal video here in future we're making it more general and more easy for you guys to follow so thanks for now this is Simon Williams aka the Ginger GM signing off and uh, hope to catch you all soon